Well, thank you, Peter, for the invitation. Um, this is the third of these that I think I've had the pleasure of attending. And uh, as always, it's a very well-organized conference, it seems. So, as Peter said, I'm supposed to be talking about is there a trend? And the objectives, just very briefly, are to give an update on Adventist Health Study 2, which is kind of a moving target. We're uh, exploring new things all the time. And also to think a little bit more about causality and at the end, a little bit about the role of religion. So Adventist Health Study 2 is mainly a study of diet and chronic disease. That is what we do here. And I'm going to have about 30 slides of information that I want to pass by very quickly, not focusing on the details, but looking at the broad trends. So this is going to require a little bit of integration, some mental work. But uh, I think this early in the morning, hopefully the little gray cells are firing enthusiastically. And um, sorry, Peter, the uh, reference to gray cells might be about as close as I get overtly to talking about the brain, but later we're going to come back to some holistic uh, themes. So uh, it, why study Adventists? And a lot of you are familiar with this, but you know, no smoking, no alcohol, or very little alcohol. And that's very useful epidemiologically because these otherwise tend to confound results when we're looking at diet. And it's very important, and one thing that people often don't realize, in the United States at least, one of the most attractive things epidemiologically is the very wide spectrum of dietary habits. We have all the way from vegans, as we'll talk about, through to people who eat uh, uh, a diet that's fairly close to the traditional American diet. And that really has a bunch of technical advantages when you have this wide range. And one of the things that we're sometimes criticized a little bit is for the atypical people in our population, those that don't eat like the average American. And of course, we have many of those in the Adventist population. But actually, that's a great advantage because if you only study people with traditional diets, that's all you can investigate. And it's partly the atypical character of this population that's a big advantage for innovative dietary exploration. We couldn't have found out about nuts and heart disease, which I'm going to talk about, if we hadn't had a bunch of people that were uh, eating a lot of nuts. We couldn't talk much about dairy in the same way unless we had people that ate virtually no dairy as a comparison group. And it turns out that AHS2 is the largest study of vegetarians and particularly vegans in the world. So I'm going to take three broad perspectives this morning. First of all, I'm going to talk about three or four foods that look like at that level of organization, just individual foods may be important for chronic disease. And they're nuts and meat, red meat, and also dairy in relation to both cardiovascular disease and also cancers, some cancers. And this is a uh, interesting slide here. Let's see if I can uh, use my pointer a little bit. You can see here, actually that doesn't seem to work. Uh, I'll turn around. You can see here that at the younger ages that um, uh, there's fairly good evidence that this group here, which are those that are eating more of meat protein, red meat protein, have a much higher risk, almost double the risk as compared to people who are eating very little meat protein, because this is a slide where we were able to put people into categories of their protein consumptions of various sorts. And we adjusted for the effects of dietary fat, so we're focusing on the protein, not the fats in the meat, and later on in the nuts. And so you can see that at least in the younger people, those that were eating more meat protein had a much higher risk. And in the uh, middle-aged people, that was also true. You can see it kicks up here again. But isn't it interesting, as you get older, there didn't seem to be nearly as much difference. And by the time you get to greater than 85, we didn't see much effect at all. So that's something, isn't it, that we could spend a lot of time and unpack further, that it seems to be particularly premature events at the younger ages that these dietary factors are preventing. 
Then we looked also at a way of looking at people who ate more or less protein from nuts and seeds. And that's what this slide is. And you can see here the same kind of thing, except the younger people are getting a big advantage because, see, they have a lower risk if they eat more of these things. True of middle-aged people, but it kind of all disappears as you get older. So it looks like for cardiovascular disease, at least, probably not cancer, probably not for total mortality, that it's the way you conduct your life, dietetically at least, in those younger and middle-aged years, which has the greatest impact. Here we look at uh, something which is now well established in the medical community, the effect of processed red meat, sausage, bacon, things like this, on risk of colorectal cancer. This is unpublished work, and it turns out that the WHO has made recommendations, and based on their analyses of a number of studies, that suggest that when you eat a sausage a day, that's about 50 grams of processed meat, your risk of colorectal cancer goes up by about 18%. But in our data, we find something rather different. At 50 grams a day, and the Adventists who eat that, many, that much processed red meat, and there's not many of them, a sausage a day, they're getting about a 60% increase in risk of colorectal cancer. So our data is a little different to, to some of the others. I now want to turn, so I've looked at nuts and I've looked at red meat from a couple of different perspectives. I want to now turn to look at calcium and dairy. And you can see that when we grouped people into high and low categories of calcium consumption and then looked at this outcome of uh, colon cancer particularly, that you can see here that those that were eating more uh, calcium in their diet, or they may have supplemented as compared to those that were eating less, these people had much less colorectal cancer. And in fact, uh, that actually, this is colon cancer. Um, trends there for colorectal, but not quite significant. And then if we look at milk, which of course is a calcium containing food that we, uh, most of us uh, eat little, or many of us do, not all of us by any means. We see for colorectal cancer, those that were in the highest quintile, fifth, of milk consumption had a reduction in risk of colorectal cancer and colon cancer by about one third. And the interesting thing is that that is consistent with the findings of a number of other large studies. So keep that in mind. Dairy, and maybe it's the calcium in the dairy, may be protective for colorectal cancer. But now, let's look at a couple of other cancers, and the picture becomes muddy. When we look at prostate cancer, and our data is consistent with a number of other studies, we find that for prostate cancer, which is the most common cancer in men, that if we look at those that are the high consumers, and this is the slide of the high consumers and the low consumers get a score of 1.0. So there's a 37% increase in risk of prostate cancer amongst the high consumers of dairy. And that was particularly true of milk. This is unpublished data as yet. And that was true in white and also black subjects, which is very important, because for reasons that are not understood well, Blacks, at least in the US, the Caribbean, and some parts of Africa have about double the risk of prostate cancer, and we don't know why. And it doesn't seem to be entirely related to diet, but the influence of dairy, in our data at least, seems similar in both racial groups. Now here's new data, hopefully going to be published very soon. We're responding to reviewers' comments that were largely positive. We are finding a similar kind of thing for breast cancer. But first of all, we have a population that eats a lot of soy. You all know that, um, at least in the United States and in the South Pacific, that's true. And so one could investigate the influence impact of soy consumption on breast cancer. And there is some data on this from the Far East. But interestingly, once we adjust for the effects of dairy, and it's important to do that because remember, people who eat a lot of soy are probably going to be the same people that don't eat the dairy, 
So there's a relationship there. It's important to adjust for these things. Otherwise, one is just a marker for the other. And when we do that, we're not finding much influence of soy uh, in this population. If one is for the low soy consumption, these numbers here are for the high consumers, and by and large, they're not significantly different from the low consumers. So not much impact of soy. But then we turn the coin over and say, well, let's have a look at dairy consumption and adjust for the effect of soy. So we're looking only at dairy in isolation, in effect. And here we find something interesting. Remember, this is for breast cancer. We're finding that the high consumers of dairy, and particularly dairy milk, have very significant increases in risk. And then we ask the question, and we could model this in our statistics, what say we model people who, instead of drinking three quarters of a cup of milk a day, replace that by three quarters of a cup, of, I'm sorry, uh, yes, of soy per day. And we find that when we do that, there's a big reduction in risk. And you might say, ah, that means soy milk's pretty good. But no, it appears it's the absence of the dairy milk that's actually important. So this is an interesting finding. Were you aware that 75% of the dairy cows are pregnant? when we get their milk, and of course by definition they're lactating, was that say about six steroids in the milk, potentially. I'm going to pass over that. So, let's step back a bit. We know that vegetarian Adventists eat more nuts, they eat less dairy, and they eat no red meat by definition. So therefore we would reasonably predict some differences in the health experience comparing vegetarian and non-vegetarian Adventists. And we can view this as a natural experiment in our midst. And so let's have a look at the data and see how that pans out. Now, we must bear in mind that this is actually a hard comparison because our non-vegetarian Adventists are low meat on average, only about three ounces a day, total red and white. So comparing our non-vegetarians to, to our vegetarians, they're not so different, and yet we still find differences. So. I think most of you are aware that we divide our vegetarians to vegans, lacto-ovo, who can uh, use dairy and eggs, and pesco, who eat the only flesh food is fish, and non-vegetarians who eat at least red meat once a week or more. I'm going to pass that. So let's look at these different kinds of vegetarians. And I'm going to pass over this very quickly because many of you will have seen this slide before. But if we look here at body weight, we're moving here on the left from low animal products. These are the vegans, lacto-ovos, pescos, non-vegetarians. Always we're moving from vegans to non-vegetarians. Notice whether we look at body weight, whether we look at currently treated for hypertension, currently treated for diabetes, currently treated for blood cholesterol. The pattern almost gets boring, doesn't it? Uh, it's very clear that the non-vegetarians are not doing as well. If we look at measures of inflammation in the body, like C-reactive protein, CRP, the same pattern. If we look at mean fasting insulin, you can see that the non-vegetarians stand out as significantly higher levels than the vegetarians, uh, each of those patterns of vegetarian. Now, again, in interest of time, I'm not going to dwell on this, but this is a slide that looks at our black, our African-American uh, study participants. And we had about 25,000 of you. And what we see here is a look at a whole bunch of risk factors uh, where we give um, one as a yes for being hypertensive. Um, oh, sorry, one as being non-vegetarian and here is the score for vegetarians. So in these uh, African-American members, there was a 44% reduction in risk if they were vegetarian. And going down this list here, you can see that nearly all these numbers are less than the 1.0, which is the score for the non-vegetarians. So uh, again, it seems like things are very similar whether you're black or white in some of these respects that we have been studying.
Now, how about comparing the vegetarian, non-vegetarian divide in terms of disease events, total mortality? And this again is a hard comparison, let me remind you, because our non-vegetarian Adventists here, these are all Adventists, get a score of one, and they are not so different to the vegetarian Adventists in the way they eat, actually, but we still see about a 12% reduction, which is significant overall, a little bit more in the males than the, uh, the women. If we turn now to coronary heart disease mortality, it's more like a... Uh, 20% reduction for the vegetarians, again, more in the males than the females. When we look at cancers, some of the common cancers, let me just explain this curve. These are people that were all free of colon cancer when they were aged 40, but by the time using a life table approach, at the end of their life, about 8% of them, see 92% survive free of colon cancer, about 8% would have got colon cancer. But notice this curve out here moved to the right is for the vegetarians. So they are surviving longer than the non-vegetarian Adventists free of colon cancer. Here's an exactly similar slide, a survival curve for breast cancer, but this time we've divided it to the uh, non-vegetarians, which are red, and this line out here, which looks a little different, they're surviving free of breast cancer longer, is the vegans. And that was not quite statistically significant. Now we need to redo this because we have more than twice as many cases. And uh, I think that will still continue to be the case. So in this natural experiment, the vegetarians versus the non-vegetarians, we found just what we may have predicted. The vegetarian Adventists were nearly always doing better than the non-vegetarians. Well, we know that the US population can be divided in a similar kind of way to Adventists and non-Adventists. And the Adventists contain a lot of vegetarians, but even the non-vegetarian Adventists live and eat very differently from the non-Adventists. So again, it would be reasonable to predict differences in the health experience between Adventists and non-Adventists, another experiment. Let's have a look and see what we find. This is a study of coronary heart disease, myocardial infarction. And this was a study actually from Adventist Health Study 1 in California compared to five cities uh, of non-Adventists in North California using the same diagnostic criteria. And that we gave the non-Adventists a score of one. Here's the comparative score of men and women Adventists. And you can see again cardiovascular disease that's mainly in these younger, middle aged, perhaps getting older, that we see the difference that premature heart attacks are apparently being prevented. You're, I'm sure, mostly familiar with the idea that in California the Adventists live about seven years longer if you're a man, about four years if a woman. If you're a vegetarian, it's nine years in a man and six years in a woman longer. The Adventists longer than non-Adventists in the same California population. This is a paper that's about to be published where for the first time we've been able to compare a national population of Adventists from HS2 to an American census population. And I'm only going to dwell on a couple of statistics here. If you look over here, this is the rate of all cancers, not mortality, new cancers. You can see on average there's a 30% reduction and the whiskers that are 95% confidence of were so tight. The experience of cancer and our Adventist Health Study 2 population is very different. And this is adjusting, by the way, for smoking. In fact, we only included non-current smokers in the census population. We had that information. And so a big difference, we adjusted for education. We look out here, this is total mortality, and we've got a 30% reduction. And again, it's hugely, hugely significant. Something important is going on. If we take the same perspective now and compare our black Adventists across the nation with the black census population of non-Adventists, and again, just focusing on all cancer and mortality, look at those perspectives. Our black members are gaining the same advantage as compared to other blacks in this same population in the United States. So again, in this natural experiment, we found just what we had predicted. 
The Adventists do much better even adjusting for these things. Now, in this day and age, it becomes important for us to think about causality, association, even though it can be highly suggestive of causality, never really proves it. In fact, causality is a very difficult thing to prove. But we need to start thinking about mechanisms and molecules and cells. And we're just starting along this. We're starting to cooperate much more with our basic science colleagues. But this slide is a recently published paper from Adventist Health Study 2, which is very interesting. You know, it's been said that we are what we eat. Well, that turns out to be really the case. Our uh, vegetarian Adventists, their bodily makeup is different to the non-vegetarians. We're finding in their blood, for instance, that the um, non-vegetarians, which are the, uh, sorry, the um, non-vegetarians are the red, and these are the vegans and the lactose and the pescos, that their levels of carotenoids in the blood are quite different. The levels of isoflavones that largely come from soy products, quite different. And also the total omega-3 fatty acids, this is in their adipose tissue, mainly linolenic in this case, are quite different. Enterolactone is a lignone that has uh, antioxidant and cell signaling properties. And one methylhistidine is an amino acid derivative which measures how much animal meat one has been eating. And of course, we see these big differences that we might have hoped to see. Now, we also took little nubbins of fat from under the skin of these people, a thousand uh, people. We um, actually paid them a little bit to do that, amongst other things. Um, and they were a random group of our study subjects. And without going to, into each of these fatty acids across the bottom here, you can again see that the adipose tissue, in vegans particularly, but also other vegetarians, is different in makeup to that of our non-vegetarian Adventists. We're just, this is very preliminary work, unpublished, but uh, Dr. Reese yesterday made mention of DNA methylation and gene expression, which is very important. Um, and what we're finding here is that in the promoter areas of genes, places where they can be methylated, but in the region of the gene particularly that seems to be the controlling area of the DNA, uh, we call these uh, promoter regions, and many of them are what we call CPG islands, that there are thousands of these sites that are more methylated in the vegans than the non-vegetarian Adventists. We don't fully understand the implications of that yet. If they're, um, did I say more methylated? They're less methylated in the vegans than the non-vegetarians. And that typically tends to prevent silencing of genes. And that can work both ways. And so we're still unpacking that. But it's clear that things are different biologically, and that's very important to know. So what can we say about causality? And I'm going to pass over this very quickly. Um, we need to be very concerned about the validity of our data. Uh, we need to be concerned about covariate adjustment. And there are various criteria that one can use for causality. And uh, again, I don't have time to go through those, but just make the point that the consistency of our data, whether we look and think about foods, whether we think about the dietary patterns, the kinds of vegetarians, or we think about a whole subculture, Adventists, the results are consistent. Other big studies of vegetarians are showing data which is very similar in most respects. We find quite strong associations. Vegetarians or Adventists are at an advantage that's not 5% or 6%, but it's 20% and 40%. And moreover, we're starting to get interested in mechanisms. Well, now, we have also published a little work, not me personally, I'm not the expert on this, on how religiosity might impact health. We had some questions on this, and it appears that positive spirituality, whether we measure that by positive religious coping or intrinsic religiosity or having spiritual meaning to one's life, that you have a feeling that you're making an impact in society and your church, that these do have effects. 
Uh, Adventists who score higher on these things have fewer depressive feelings, less negative emotionality, and scored on quality of life and uh, measures, they have increased well-being. So um, it seems like the more religious and involved Adventists, because of their religion, are more interested in personal health, they're better educated about lifestyle, they often have much more social support for change and maintenance coming from family and friends, and moreover, they have access to better culinary skills and have higher expectations about their diet. So I'm convinced that our religious beliefs and the value system that that instills are central to our success as an organization in promoting health. So in concluding, so compared to non-Adventists, Adventists are on average obviously at much lower risk. They have less cancer, heart disease, they live longer. Within the Adventist population, those that subscribe to variants of plant-based diets seem to have much lower rates of many of these chronic diseases, true in black and white Adventists in this country at least. To date, we've found no disease endpoints where the vegetarians clearly do worse. Maybe they exist. Certain foods characteristic of vegetarian diets have apparently been identified as maybe being important, the red meats, dairy in complicated ways, nuts for coronary heart disease. And we're starting to talk about a number of cellular and biochemical mechanisms, also effects on body weight, the physiology of that, that could provide plausible explanations. So many of the Bradford Hill criteria for causality appear to be satisfied or likely satisfied, and I wasn't really able to unpack that in detail, but you could get the sense of that. So we started out, holistic outcomes of HS2, is there a trend? Well, yes, you could say that, but I think it would be more accurate to say that the data now is becoming a landslide. So health benefits, both personally and for the planet, should be strong motivation for many rational people to pursue dietary change in the plant-based direction. For you, health promotion experts and administrators, there is now no lack of good information to work with. And finally, from a health perspective, I think we're so fortunate to be Adventists. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.